Bond's going through a bit of a transitional phase at the moment. Um, we're... So, how do I describe it? So Scotland is... I think Scotland's going to be independent. Um, and the reason I think that is because, slowly but surely, uh, Scotland has been taking uh, independence measures from the UK. Um, we're in charge of a lot of our own taxes, we have our own parliament, uh, we have, since the, the last uh, Scottish uh, independence referendum, we have, it, it's actually a really interesting thing happened during the Scottish independence referendum. Yeah. Go on another tangent just to get you there. Um, So during during this, before the Scottish independence referendum a few years ago, there was the question of independence, like you know, around, but it, it never Scots hadn't really thought about it since the 70s. And in the 70s, there was a vote that was like clearly no, we want to stay in the UK. But this time around, part of what happened, where the, the final result was like 45% wanted to. Uh, go independent and 55% wanted to stay with the UK um, as a summary. And a weird thing happened near the end of the, the campaign. It looked like Scottish independence was going to win the win the vote. So every single party in the UK that wasn't the SNP, so this was Labour, which is the kind of British equivalent of Democrats, Conservatives, which is the British equivalent Republicans, the Lib Dems, which is like somewhere in the middle between right and far right, um, they, all of them were anti-independent. The only pro-independence party was the SNP, right? Now the SNP are, they're, before, before Scottish independence, they were kind of like a, I guess, I don't know, 20%, 35% party, you know, they were sort of alongside the Liberal Democrats was generally the third choice in the UK, you know? But they were the only party during the Scottish referendum to sit to go with, um, to, who were pro-independence. And what ended up happening was the, the independence vote, even though it was 45%, 55%, the SNP being the only party behind the vote, ended up kind of representing half of the country. And when you have one party representing half of the country and the other parties just like unanimously going, no, we're anti-independence for Scotland, it basically meant that like the SNP were sort of considered the 50% party. Oh, oh, I will take that. Top three in Scotland. I wonder who, I wonder who's ahead of us in Scotland. Oh! <gasps> Let's go! Oh, Scotty. Scotty, you're nothing. Nothing. Look at that. Fifth place. Look. One, one more Scott speeds ahead of you. You're really on the leaderboard. Oh. You in here right now? I don't think you are, but... Improve, boy. Anyway, okay, so... The SNP... Um, they, because they um, ended up representing half the country, in spite of being um, a smaller party, after the Scottish referendum, they ended up like sort of being half of the political uh, movement in Scotland. So the next ref the next vote they had after the Scottish referendum, um, they won like fifty percent of the votes generally and because we weren't in first past the post, it meant that the SNP took control of um, took control of Scottish politics. And they're the dominant party. Um, and not only are they the dominant party, but they're also kind of they're kind of forming a large voice in the UK. But well that that's not true actually. They're not a large voice politically in the UK. Um, but another thing that happened after the after the referendum, in order for um, 
In the last few days of the referendum, when it looked like Scotland might vote to go independent, one of the things that all of the other parties did, and especially the Conservatives who were uh, in power at the time, was they made a bunch of concessions and they said, if you stay in the UK, we will, we will grant you new powers for Scotland. We will make sure that you can run more independently and make your own choices uh, outside of the outside of the UK system. Like, the UK does not dictate your um, various tax policies. And Scotland was already like had a few of, it, of its own kind of like dictating its own tax laws and employment stuff. But one of the things that happened after this independence vote, even though Scotland ultimately voted not to go independent, was they were given promises of more independent than where they were before. And so they they took them, the, the SNP took them and they said, okay, cool, so now we, we have more independence in Scotland. Not, we're not separate from the UK, we're not leaving the Union yet, but we have more independent powers. And um, what, what they've done with that is Nicola Sturgeon has essentially like run a lot more, well the SNP as a whole, have run Scotland more independent, independently than it used to be. Um, where am I going with it? Well, up until two, three years ago, they did polling on Scottish it basically stuck around the same level as the referendum, you know? 55% for independence, 45% against. But an important thing in that time has been that the Conservatives have been in power the whole time. And people in Scotland hate Conservatives. Like, to the point, like, Scotland, I would say, is a much more left leaning country than the UK, than the, the average for the UK, especially England. Um, so the, the Conservatives are usually competing with the Greens in Scotland, but the Conservatives are also the, the party in power across uh, the rest of the UK. So in Scotland, the longer you have a party that everyone hates, sort of leading your, your union, while you as a nation detest them, the more you're going to be like, uh, maybe I really don't want the Conservatives to... I don't want to be ruled by these people that I don't that I don't stand for and I don't agree with. Um, but still, you know, that that's like a slow burn going on. A slow case of stuff that's happening. Um, but then, two years ago, COVID hit, you know? This, the global, the Backstreet Boys World Tour pandemic to end all pandemics first of many you know worst years of our lives so far um all of that stuff and um the uk did not fare well i'm gonna say it in london like london was the epicenter of the pandemic for so so long in the uk and you know i i experienced it was, I, I mean, I'm not going to go too... I'll, I'm sure I can talk about, like, my experience of it um, at some later point. But ju I'm just going to say it was... It was tragic. And it was... It felt like... There were so many moments where I was just like... I was doing my best personally to, you know, be sensible and to, you know, do what we can to support each other. But then you would witness these things and be like, oh, come on. Like, we're just, we're screwed. Um, but you know one place that did handle the pandemic well? Scotland. You know who was leading Scotland's pandemic response? SNP and Nicola Sturt. So, for the last two years, Scotland has been outperforming the UK and mandating its own pandemic response and because it's been outperforming the UK there's this really awkward situation where Scotland is kind of popping up it's leading things it's actually like you know it's managing itself fairly well outside not outside UK rule but like in opposition to UK rule and another thing that happened which I thought was the most genius thing was the SNP said 
No, we're not gonna we're not, we're not gonna talk about N2. We can talk about that later. But now what's important, pandemic response, right? And I did two things. First of all, if you hate the SNP, if you've been hearing, if you're like, you know what, I'll never vote SNP because all they care about is independence. They're not talking about independence now. And you're like, huh. Oh wow, they actually, they're not just using this as a political, uh, as a political tool. They're actually trying to make sure that we, you know, that we stick together and survive as a country. And if you're pro-independence, you're not, you're not, I don't know, you're, I feel like if you're pro-independence for Scotland, you, it's, it's much harder to make you switch to the other side. Um, you know, because like, it's, it's almost like there's, it feels to me like there's been a shift from, it's the yes, party's argument to make to it's the no party's argument you know? as in like you, you're looking at the UK and the, the pandemic response and I mean the conservatives are underperforming compared to the rest of Europe um, I mean that's another factor too hey, the conservatives are underperforming compared to the rest of Europe um, they are they're making Britain look like a joke in terms of their pandemic response. Um, Scotland is outperforming them, and people love Nicola. You know, like she is, she's just an icon um, in so many ways. Um, it's it's interesting how it's interesting to me how I remember when AOC uh, Alexander Gasson says when she came to the UK, Nicola Sturgeon, or when she came to Scotland for. Um, COP26, I think, I think it was COP26. Um, Nicola Sturgeon gave her an iron brew and they got a photo together, right? And there's this perception, and I have it, I, I don't know how accurate it is, but, um, but the SNP, I mean, yeah, they are, they're progressive. They're progressive in the same way AOC is in the US, except AOC is not uh, running the country, but Nicola Sturgeon is. So like, it's kind of like, Nicola Sturgeon is kind of like a, um, the most socialist kind of leader, um, which, you know, with policies that, that I would say most people uh, agree with. Um, and she's kind of, she's sharing the world stage with people. She's showing herself that she, I mean, she's basically a prime minister slash president of, of, of a country, right? So she's like, she, she basically, she is a head of state in the same way of Boris Johnson, of uh, President Biden, of, of any other world leader. Um, and I, I know, yeah, yeah, she, she is physically head of state of Scotland, but the people sort of think of Scotland as part of the UK rather than um, rather than its own independent thing, or at least they used to. But now, like, they ha they kind of have all of the, the ingredients right now of being an independent state, you know? Like, we've, we've run our own, um, we've run our own taxes and, and, and most of our own kind of finances, we have our own parliament, uh, we, we've performed brilliantly throughout the, the pandemic um, compared to uh, comparable needs. Um, we have a leader that people look up to and admire. Um, so what I think has happened is the independence vote, I mean, yes, and yes, polling for um, independence has been moving towards independence and away from um, um, and away from staying in the union, but like, oh, is that? I think I might need to look at the lines. I'm just tough. Yeah, so Scotland, Scotland feels like a. It, it feels like it's ready. You know what I mean? Um, all the polling's going that way. All of the. Kind of thinking around, um, but it, it it feels like an independent nation outside of the union, and 
I mean, there's another factor to it as well. And that is the European Union. Now, Scotland, during the, the Brexit, Scotland was heavily pro-European Union, right? And one of the one of the so the, the the Scottish referendum happened before Brexit, and one of the key arguments in the Scottish referendum was that Scotland would not be allowed to, like Scotland would have to get rid of the pound, and would not be allowed into Europe because Europe wouldn't want Scotland. Why would Europe want Europe want Scotland? Say forward-thinking progressive nation. I mean, no. I mean, Europe would not want, you know. Um, oh. um, yeah, but one of the arguments that came up during the Scottish referendum was that we we would be, you know, we wouldn't be able to join Europe and we would have to lose the pound. But like, we're out of Europe now anyway, and pound is uh, it's not not the the powerhouse it once was. Um, I mean, so many, so many of the, um, uh, I you know what, I'm, I'm not qualified entirely to speak on this, but, but my opinion is that the, the financial power of Britain as a world leader has been in decline, especially since leaving the European Union. And financial firms, financial firms don't care about anything. They don't, they don't care about like, remaining British. They, they want to go where the money is. They want to go where the, the influence is. So there is an argument that being part, that having all their headquarters and the capital of finance be in Europe is actually more sensible than keeping it in Britain. So I actually think a lot of the of Britain's financial weight is is coming away a little bit. So a lot of the argument about the pound being, you know, the be all and end all is, you know, fading a little bit. And the arguments about being in Europe, well, you know, we're more likely to be in Europe if, if you leave uh, the UK now. So, like, all of these things are just kind of lining up in such a way that I just think independence is... It feels inevitable. I mean, I could be I could be in a little bit of a bubble here, because I'm certainly more... Um, certainly more, in, like, in line with the S&P's values than the... Uh, and the Conservatives and the kind of UK in general, I would say. Um, okay. um, yeah, and another aspect of the what, what I was saying before about the SNP not talking about independence during the pandemic was it, it showed them to be like so much more responsible than the UK as a whole, and it ended up getting other parties talking about independence when it came to Scotland's performance. And, you know, anytime a question came, anytime, or even, maybe it's even just the narrative that's created by this whole situation. I don't, that it, it feels to me like other parties end up having to say, oh, the, the, the SNP, they only care about independence. But like, when the SNP are like, exclusively not talking about independence, and they're just like, no, 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 we're just, we're just trying to talk about this. The solving this pandemic. Um, you, what you end up do, doing is getting other parties to sort of share your cause for you, you know. Um, and anytime, if you if you have journalists who are um, anti-independence, like at press conferences, saying, "Is the SNP trying to use COVID to advance their independence narrative?" They can just say, "We." Uh, we are not going to talk about independence after COVID. And it's like, you see what I mean? It's like the perfect response. It's like, I'm not talking about independence. You're talking about independence. You want to talk about independence? I mean, we can do that. I don't know. If you think it's a good idea, we can, uh, we can uh, do that. I'm not. I mean, I, I don't. I don't know inside baseball or politics enough to know if that was like part of the narrative or if it was if it was just very lucky. I mean, it, it had to. If you're a politician, especially if you're a politician, especially one as with as many wins under the belt as the SNP, you must know that choosing not to talk about independence like has an impact, right? Like they must have done some strategizing because. 
one, one of the, the main goals of the SNP is independence. And you can't forget that. It's in, the, it's in the party name, you know? Scottish National Party. So, like, when they're trying to calculate whether to whether to do something or not, it's got to factor into it. Um, and I think it, it's played out beautifully um, in the last two years. But yeah, but even even like their way of dealing with COVID and not talking about independence has ultimately helped with their. And I don't I don't know if I said this directly, um, but I think. I think the argument that uh, the big the big sticking point for a lot of Scots, um, or at least I, I think I, I've spoken to a few that feel this way. The big sticking point is feeling like we couldn't make it on our own, right? And it's kind of a it's it's kind of a weird one where it's it's hard for I think it's hard for Scottish people to argue for the UK being a more unified. Um, group at the moment because of the whole Europe thing. You know? It's like, I mean, if, if you think we're better as a unified group, why England and why not Europe? You know? But the other, which, and the, the feeling that I think is more prescient when it comes to, like, Scotland not being independent is that Scotland couldn't make it on its own as a, a, a nation. I, I said, I said before that I felt like, um, Scotland didn't really have an esports community. Part of that feeling is because it's almost like, yeah, because the esports community isn't Scottish, it's British esports. There's a British esports community, you know, you got, um, you know, uh, in the melee scene, uh, well, the melee UK scene is quite, uh, what was his name? The guy who did the, um, he did the, the melee speedrun. I don't remember his name. But yeah, there's like a UK uh, melee, like esports scene. Thinking of a um, Scottish melee scene, or Scottish um, esports scene, not so much. Um, yeah, so even like even thinking about that, it's, it's interesting how my own thinking is as Scotland as part of the UK, you know? So it. People have a, a, a difficult time getting over the ambiguity of how well Scotland would do outside the UK, you know? It's, uh, it's a relationship we've always known, or at least this generation has always known, so thinking of ourselves without it, like, it takes more of a mental leap and ultimately staying with the Union. This idea that the, the, the moderate position is to stick with the status quo, and the status quo is uh, anti-independence, right? So the biggest th the biggest uh, blocker to British people thinking of themselves outside the UK is us running as an independent nation. But with the SNP doing so much good work to run Scotland as an independent nation, it's almost like we're living that way in practicality, even if if, if not in um, in uh, theory, you know. Like, if, if Scotland is independent in all ways but the vote, then it makes it much easier for, uh, it mu makes it much easier for people who are anti-independent to go, oh, maybe I could see Scotland. Or even, going one step further, it could even sway them towards it, thinking, why, what, what is this nonsense that we can't be independent? We are independent, you know? We've shown that we're independent already. This this vote is a formality, and I think a lot of the a lot of the ways that the SNP have been working, or in my mind, the effect of what they've been doing and what I think they've been trying to do is to get Scot Scottish people and Scotland whole thinking of itself as um, an independent nation, and then just the vote is a formality rather than this, rather than a, like. Rather than trying to go for this more, well, I don't know if risky is the right word, but more going for the more like bullish approach of getting people to sort of like think of themselves as like you know, freedom, we got to do this. Yeah. It's much easier to 
it's much easier to have people in a set position and then let them vote with that set position than it is to convince them away from that position like when the time comes. Well, ultimately, if, um, if there was another vote like today, all of the people who are on the, the maybe side, who are unconvinced, are the, the fact is they're more likely to fall on the choice of what they've already seen before. Yeah, they're more likely to fall in the position of uh, doing what they've already done. You know? um, so, so by moving the, the feeling of what it is to be Scottish, um, not what it is, but by moving the feeling of what Scotland is, dependent versus uh, in a union, um, means that like the default position people will fall on is not Scotland being in a union, it's Scotland being independent. Um, and I think ultimately that that's the goal of the um, and that's the that's the strategy of the SNP is to move, is to move Scotland to a more place, uh, a more like national feeling of independence. Um, and then it means when the vote comes around, it's much more likely to fall on the side of independence. Um, and I think they've succeeded with that, and that's why Scotland is equal that way. 